Hello, how are you? All right, now I wait for the house for and I get stuck with this money. Maybe you wait about the guy, wait the Makoko. Hold up. Yeah. Ha. Okay. When I see this link, now for now wait for the house for Where's the doubt? Where that fall you in Nigeria? Hello, don't think about it. This link it go carry you direct. Go the place where we say it go help you choose which investment you want to do for Nigeria. Any investment, whether na waiting, whether na bank shares, whether na agriculture, whether na real estate, whether na stock exchange, any investment you want to do. Make sure say you click on because anything free happen for that for any time and it go better. Say if you come to Nigeria, you go get where you go relax and you get investment to fall back to. Hello, make sure say you click on more because you won't say what. Eh? Where that? Hey, okay. See, make I help you click the link. Make to click, make to click oh. waiting. When we say now, I'm be alone from my school, you go. You know, yeah, when I talk, say now nah, for people waiting for the diaspora. People waiting for the diaspora, what are they called? I know, go, oh, they oh, go, oh, go, oh, go, oh, go, oh, go. They are called diasporans, oh, there. Let me talk to my diasporans people. Make sure say you click this link, oh, yeah, to betterment your life. Because when you both say what? The investment in your country, in Nigeria, is a forever life betterment. Thank you. <laughs> you see there, yeah. if you say you don't get job for filling station, I'll be, you see there, yeah. go, go, not. Masai Ujiri, the Nigerian who led Toronto Raptors to a historic NBA victory. Masai Ujiri, Raptors president of basketball operations, changed the face of the team when he brought the San Antonio Spurs' Kawhi Leonard, an NBA champion and a three-time NBA All-Star, to Toronto last summer. Ujiri was born in England on the 7th of July 1970 to a Nigerian father and a Kenyan mother. He was raised in Zaria, Kaduna State, until he moved to the United States to attend high school with an ambition of playing college basketball. He also promotes basketball development across Africa as director of the NBA's Basketball Without Borders program. Proudly Nigerian. Wow, such an honor, such an honor to be with you guys today. I, I, I want to say it's really special um, uh, for me to represent uh, the country, uh, to represent Nigeria. Um, seeing everybody here uh, makes me happy. Seeing that rock uh, makes me happy and um, brings back so much unbelievable memories. I grew up uh, in Zaria in Northern Nigeria and um, what, what an incredible, incredible uh, childhood I had um, uh, growing up in that part of the country and um, learning all the values um, of life that really um, presents itself now for us to even tackle the world and tackle what we do um, as professionals, as human beings, as persons. Uh, so uh, it's such an honor to be with you guys today. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your journey. We know you grew up in Nigeria. You obviously went to uh, the U.S. for high school and then went on to play professional basketball as well. What was that journey, especially as someone who grew up in a country that favors football? How did you find your way in basketball and be so legendary at it? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I I started playing football, you know, that's the love of all of us. We come out of our mother's stomach and we start playing football right away. So um, I started playing football um, at a young age in, in Zaria and then found the game of basketball through my coach, Oliver Johnson, uh, in ABU, uh, uh, Zaria, and playing on the outdoor course here. Uh, and then the love of the game, you know, took me on this unbelievable journey uh, to the States where I um, played basketball in prep school, went to college, uh, and then went to, to play professional. I wasn't a very good professional, but um, I managed to kind of um, hang, hang, hang in there. And uh, on that way, I was proud that in 97, I, I played for Nigeria, the national team, and developed um, this love for coaching and also watching younger players. I, I knew I wasn't going to be good enough to be a professional player at a high level 
and my thinking started going towards um, sports, working in sports, scouting, and scouring the world for talent. And that's how I uh, started scouting. And honestly, by the grace of God, I'm Nigerian. You persevere. Um, you're resilient. You you continue to try and work hard. Uh, you try you, know, you try to really really um, do your best, and um, you you you. There's struggles on the way. You know, all of us go through those struggles, and I tried so hard uh, in, in in every way uh, uh, to respect people along the way, be honest along the way. Try to help people along the way, um, and you know, find this passion in the game. Because sometimes when we were growing up, there was a lot of concentration on to go to school, go to school, go to school, which helped me. My parents were educationists, but um, I found a way in sports, and there was something new in sports where um, I had to I had to build myself in some in some kind of way. So. Um, I got promoted, and uh, by the grace of God, I was able to uh, get a job with Denver. Um, I started with Orlando. I was an update scout. I worked for a year without getting paid. And you just keep going, keep grinding, um, keep plugging away. And then um, I, I, I found myself in this position, first as general manager, and now I'm president of the team. And uh, there's been a lot of people that have helped along the way, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to be Nigerian and proud to be African. Oh, lovely. You. We really enjoyed that one. And Mr. Mosiah, I have to ask this question as well. What does it mean now, as you're very lucrative and your, your resume speaks for itself, what does it mean being in your position as a Nigerian for the representation for the Nigerians in the diaspora and Nigerians back home? Uh, it, it means so much because you carry a weight on your shoulder, but you carry it proudly. You know, I, 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 I love where I'm from. And it's the first thing that when, you, when you're in camp, when you're teaching youth, when we travel all over the continent is, um, tell me your name. What's your name? My name is Masai Ujiri. And where are you from? Uh, I'm from Nigeria. I'm proud of that. Uh, that's, that's first and, and foremost. So... I have to represent well because I know these positions don't come easy. They don't come often. Yeah, so uh, I have to do well. I have to win. I have to win on the court and I have to win off the court. And as you win off the court, you have to bring people along. It's so important that you bring people along because I don't want to be known as the only African that has managed a, a, a sports team in North America. That's not my goal. My goal is to bring other people along that are going to come after me um, because I'm not going to last forever. That's, that's just sports. That's life. That's, uh, that, that's, that's how it works, you know. So but while you're doing this, you just have to bring other people along. So um, hopefully um, this means a lot to me and hopefully we can carry on and inspire the youth and the next generation. Oh, that's well, incredible. I'll let you know right now, we are absolutely so proud of you. We're so proud to know that you are, you are representing Africa in general as someone who is not, both Nigerian and Kenyan. We have Lainey here with us as well, who I know she has a couple questions to, to ask as well before sending you into this moderation, where you can share more of your wisdom with the next uh, moderator as well. So Lainey, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, we had a little technical problem. So Masai, um, you've, you've, had a little, you've had the opportunity to talk a little bit about what you've been doing with the MBA. Let's kind of take you back to the beginning because I know people are curious of how do you go from playing basketball in Zaria to becoming who you are right now? So we know you played um, professionally in Europe um, for several years. You returned back to Nigeria as a youth coach. What stands out in your mind about this pivotal period in your life that has set the stage for who you are today? Uh, honestly, Bemi, it's, 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 uh, it's upbringing, it's character, it's, it's the experience that you've lived, you know, and, uh, and I'm proud of that. I, I grew up like everybody else, you know, like I was, my parents, middle class, um, uh, living in Zaria, um, I went to staff school, demonstration, secondary school, like uh, you had all that upbringing, you had all that 
teaching, you know, um, where your parents were strict with you with education, they were strict with you um, with discipline. And um, that's what you live off of now, you know, but all the other experiences, I, I, I love them. I grew up with Muslims and Christians. I grew up uh, in the time of austerity. I grew up uh, in times when uh, things were hard and things were tough. And I, drew, I grew up in times when I followed politics in, in times when I followed um, the current president, when he was president before. Then I grew up in times when I watched football and, and idolized Stephen Keshia and Henry Wosu and all those people. So um, all those build your character in some kind of way. And uh, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of um, that grind you go through and that builds who you are as a person. I'm proud of my parents, how they raised me. Um, there's, there's nothing like that. I'm so proud of my friends and people that I know. Well, you, you, you truly are a remarkable ambassador to Nigeria. When you won the championship last year, you made it a point to come to Nigeria in August with the NBA Larry O'Brien trophy. What did that mean to you to bring the trophy to Nigeria? Oh, uh, trust me, that was the first place I was coming, you know, like nobody, <laughs> nobody was stopping that one. You know, I, I needed, I, I, this is, is pride, right? Is, is where you're from, is, is the blood and sweat, is the people that have helped you, the people that encourage you, the people that pray for you. And you know, when we're playing through those championships, I cannot imagine, you cannot imagine how many texts I got from Africans, from Nigerians saying, by the grace of God, we're going to win. <laughs> yes. Allah, we're going to take the next one, you know? And that, yeah. those are the things that make you, you know? Those For are the sure, things man. that you live off of. And I was so happy, so uh, uh, to, to go back, to show my parents this trophy, to show Nigeria this trophy, um, to go back to Zaria and actually have this trophy on the basketball court where I started playing and to take it to my basketball coach um, was an unbelievable, unbelievable. I was supposed to actually bring the trophy to uh, President Buhari, but the timing did not work out because um, I, I can't remember why the timing didn't work out, but I was happy to see him at the African Union. Masai, you're so proud of being Nigerian. I mean, you've made, it a, you've made it a point, almost a mission of yours to ensure that you're contributing to the positive narrative of Nigeria and Africa as a whole, particularly with the work you do with your foundation, Giants of Africa. ESPN recently featured a documentary of the foundation. Can you please tell us a little bit about Giants of Africa and what inspired you to start it? Uh, well, I, I wanted to, you want to give back, you know, because when you put in positions like this, you know, like you can live it and live it. Um, but I wanted to put myself in the position of where I was as a youth and what those kids like myself would be going through now and what they need. So I knew that they needed shoes, they needed jerseys, they needed basketball camps to be taught basic fundamentals. But you also need them uh, you, you also need to teach these kids the life skills. Um, how, what, what it, what's important? So I said it before, um, what's your name? Where are you, where are you from? Honesty, uh, being on time, respecting women. We have to respect women. It's something I want to say uh, very, very boldly here. It's something that is very important for us. And so you teach these kids as they are young. And for me, Giants of Africa uses basketball as a tool, okay, to teach these kids what life is really about. Because not all of them are going to end up being NBA players, but most of them and all of them, are, all of them are going to end up being men and women. And so it was a mission for me to spread this around the continent. So whether mm -hmm. it's building courts, or whether it's bringing coaches to teach the basic fundamentals of basketball, or whether it's setting up programs that are going to set a path for this youth. It just became extremely important for me to come back every summer during my downtime to actually impact this youth the best way that we can. That's amazing. You speak about sports being a transformational tool, and you talk about that often. Last year, when you were at the African Union with the Canadian um, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, you engaged with several African leaders, including His Excellency President Buhari, and you kept talking to everyone about the importance of sports and the power of it. Considering all the recent development um, globally in, in sports, how do you see Africa and Nigeria fitting into this? 
Well, it's, it's so important, Bemi, and it's a great question. You know, um, I, I hope this is a, a, an incredible platform to really tell people that uh, there is an ecosystem around sports. I live it. I know it. Um, where I see the business of sports. And when I look at the talent that we have on the continent of Africa, whether it's football, basketball, track and field, whatever it is, we have to create the business. Yeah, so we have all these players playing overseas, playing in Liverpool, playing in Arsenal, playing in the NBA. And in my mind, why haven't we thought about creating our own leagues to that level? Because we have the talent. Now, do we have the facilities? Do we have the mindset? Do we have um, what it takes, you know, um, uh, the grind uh, to really figure this out, the education, the information uh, to figure this out? This is where I want Africa to use me, you know, and use some of us at Diaspora because We've experienced this. I know how much my company makes. I know how much revenue it brings. I know how, what's, how many jobs sports gives people. So I want to transform those national stadiums. We look at our national stadium in Nigeria. Why does it look like that? Why is it, mm -hmm. why is it that way? Why can't we transform it into the way my arena and our stadiums look? where there are shops, there are jobs, there are restaurants, and there it's pro producing places uh, to hold um, concerts, different things, and it becomes a machine. This is what we're talking about here, and it's really important that we have to start thinking that mindset. Okay. Okay, final question before we hand over to, um, to the panel. I know this question is on the minds of a lot of basketball fans in Africa, and I have to ask this question. We all got very excited last year when the NBA announced that it's going to have a league in Africa called BAL. Is that still happening and where does that stand right now? Uh, yes, it is. And obviously with COVID, it, it slowed us down. You know, this is, this is the real, uh, like uh, President Buhari said, it's the new normal um, everywhere. We have to adjust to that. And, and this is something we're trying to, uh, trying to adjust to. I know my good friend Amadou Fall is, is, is really thinking about this and how I think they are planning uh, to actually hold this league in a bubble in September or October. But it was full force. The NBA is behind this. I know Amadou is leading this in full force. And this is what I'm talking about, about the ecosystem and about how basketball is going to come to all of us at our door is going to come to us on our screens and we're going to watch basketball being played professionally where people are actually doing it to entertain too. Yeah, so I know it's coming. It's just slowed us down a little bit with COVID, but I know Amadou Fall and the NBA are really working on this. That's incredible to hear. Thank you so much for your time. So now I'm going to hand over to the moderator of um, the next um, panel. So now let's get down to it. Let's have a really good time having this conversation. What can we do and how can sports become that for us as Nigerians to be able to work together versus having our own little thing all over the place? Well, it starts by here. It always starts by, thank you. Thank you for, for saying all the, the kind words. I really appreciate you. Um, it, it starts by us just um, talking about it, the awareness, you know, so a lot of the education, um, the information you give, uh, as I talked about, a lot of us are not aware of mm -hmm. how big sports is and how much sports unites people together. You know, you, if you say there's a football game today and Nigeria is playing again somewhere, you know, you, you, you can imagine what it does, whether it's in Nigeria or at Diaspora, you, you, you see wherever we are, if there's a, the way we follow Arsenal and Liverpool and the Toronto Raptors and everything, it just unites us, right, in some kind of uh, incredible way. We now have to, we as Africans and Nigerians, and I say Africa as a whole because there's so much talent on the continent. Yeah, so we as a whole really, really have to understand this. And I'm appealing to you people as business people and whatever field you are, there's a, there's a part in sports that you can play. There are sports lawyers, there are sports educationists, there are sports psychologists, there's in every aspect of it, 
I have people that work with me that work in sports. Okay, that, that, I have people that, that work in all fields, whether it's medical, whether it's analytics, whether it's law, whether it's governance, whether it's rules, whatever you think of. So there's a lot of employment that can be by it. So in Nigeria and in Africa, we have to pay attention to building facilities, right? And encouraging the youth, youth development, more games in secondary schools and in primary schools. And that's how it's going to emerge. But it starts from here, from you talking about it. Thank you so much. Very great. And that segues to Dr. Yetunde. I want to bring you on because there was something that uh, Mr. Yuri said when he was talking about his, uh, you know, like how he introduces himself. People are interested in your name and they ask you about yeah. your name. And when I talked to you yesterday, that was what, something that I felt like, you know, you brought up. So you were born here, you were raised here, but you have been very engaged in the diaspora community. How has how has being a Nigerian, how has that helped you in all the progress that you have made? And to the point that you just made, how can you as a professor begin to change the narrative about who we are as Nigerians and as Africans? Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that question. And I am so happy to join such a wonderful panel. And thank you to also Masai, because we, you know, when you won that trophy, although we're from New Jersey, we really were, you know, championing and happy with Toronto. So I, I remember that day uh, very vividly. So thank you for your leadership in, in ushering such a wonderful team. Um, with that being said, our name is our identity. And I feel like that's one of the first things that goes when we try to assimilate in a, in a country that although welcomes all cultures, but at the same time, it's how do we find that balance between the American dream and the background of coming from Nigeria? And sometimes we try to accommodate to this American dream by really kind of giving a nickname or shortening our name or using our middle name because we feel as though it's easier for people to pronounce. I found myself doing that earlier, earlier on when I was in high school, trying to assimilate. Even though I was born here, I felt, well, it was easier for them to pronounce Victoria. But I realized that as I got older that my name was a form of my identification. It was showing you where I come from. It was a way of not only giving honor to my background, but also giving honor to my parents who came here many years ago in the pursuit to ensure that I also had opportunities, right? And these same opportunities that we are trying to create for those who are living and born in Nigeria. So, and as a professor, I teach imperialism. And one of the things about students is that, you know, my job is to bring the world to them. They may not have the opportunity to travel to another part of the world. They may never have the opportunity to maybe meet someone like me. But what I can do through my teaching is to let them know that Look, the world as we know it is uneven. Not everybody got a fresh start and not everybody got to, you know, to win the race when it started. But what happens is that there are historical contexts to the issues that we see in the world. And if you look at African countries, they may say some of it, why is some of these areas undeveloped? But the same issues that you may see on the African continent is the same issues you may see in Latin America. It's the same issue that you may see in Asia. So we, 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 there's an embodiment of understanding that we are where we are because of historical interferences, because of issues that, we, that were out of our control. And when they start learning the history of Africa, they get a better sense of, wow, this is a place that has a rich history. This is a place that has been through some things such as colonialism and all types of other issues that some other countries have also been through. But at the same time, we have been able to reshape our story. And, and that being said, mm. by being an Af a Nigerian, first generation Nigerian American woman walking to a classroom filled with a lot of people who don't look like me. So when the semester's over and I have a few of the, you know, the black students who come up to me and say, you know, this is my first time of having, you know, an African American woman mm. as a professor. Representation does something. Same thing as Maasai yeah. and everybody who's in these positions. When we are in a position, we represent our country. We represent our culture. Mm -hmm. And so when we excel and when we do good, we lift the whole nation with us. And that is our responsibility. And, and, of, and, and, and I'm happy to carry that mm. responsibility proudly and forward. Hmm. That's awesome. Yes, I could tell that from just speaking with you, you know, before this event. <laughs> yeah. But I thank you so much for sharing that. And there's, I have another... 
uh, uh, Fatima was actually born in New Jersey as well, and she's second generation Nigerian. And one of the things that she's done recently, which I believe a lot of uh, Nigerians want their next generation to do, is actually going back home. And, uh, and in her case, she went back to do the NYSC. So just speaking with her, I was so excited that, okay, there's, you know, there's hope for her going back home. So Fatima, I just wanted to call on you, if you don't mind, uh, to just share a little bit of your experience. What has been the most incredible learning going back? And how would you describe your transition from the United States back to Nigeria, not having been raised there? And for uh, people that want to do the same thing that you've just done, what, what, would, what are the tips that you have to share? Well, I've had the privilege to be coming back every other year before I even was able to do my NYSC service. So um, this has been my longest stay since visiting and their tradition, transition was quite um, an experience. I really enjoyed the youth court service that, um, yeah. that I've done. Um, I served at the Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution, and I recently finished uh, this month. Um, yeah. So I know the system is completely different from America, but um, I still was able to transition with some time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Musa, thank you so much. And I just wanted you to share a little bit uh, Having uh, been a Nigerian living in Saudi Arabia, of course, culturally, I'm sure there are a number of things that, you know, may be different, but I just wanted you to kind of share with us how, how were you able to make the transition? Because I know you guys are now uh, very rooted back in Nigeria, you and your brothers, Imran and you, and, and I kind of know the uh, Ayari. So you want to share with us how you made that transition not only going back but actually setting up businesses that are thriving in nigeria even though you actually leave res uh, you, you, you're residents of saudi arabia yes i'm very happy to be with you here uh, i'm very happy for this uh time to uh, the time that i'm going to spend with you we are very glad to be with you also on this media uh, seriously, uh, um, we, we, I born and grew up in Saudi Arabia, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So in 2003, I decided to finish my school, which is university in, uh, in Nigeria. So I came to Nigeria in 2003. It was very difficult time at that time because, as you know, the main language, is, uh, I know it was Arabic. So I have a challenge is to learn English and continue in Nigeria. It was a very difficult time, but I passed it uh, with the help of the people around me. And I finished my, uh, my, uh, my BSc in Nigeria. And after that, I came back to Saudi Arabia and they started design how we can do something in Nigeria. There is many people in Saudi Arabia that have uh, interest in Nigeria, to come to Nigeria and work in Nigeria, but they need uh, support from, uh, uh, with organization like now NITCOM, something has uh, become clear for us and uh, their goals has become clear and the target is clear. So uh, in 2015, we, we established Aliaro International uh, Limited, and uh, this company is a group of Nigerians living in Saudi Arabia, the, the one that established it. And the company started working. And now we, we are managing a lot of uh, projects in Nigeria. One of the things that we're trying to talk about here on this panel is really how to thrive in your resident country as Nigerians. And you are an example of someone that you, you've been thriving. You know, you've been through all of that, not having been, I mean, you just, it was like, you know, you went from playing soccer to basketball and now you're one of the leaders. So one of the things I wanted to find out from you, uh, if you could share with us, what were your key learning experiences going, you know, just climbing through the ladder with all the politics? I mean, I can tell you when I first came to the United States, I didn't understand the politics at all because as Nigerians, you know, you say the way it is, <laughs> but here you have to kind of like do the dance and all of that. So uh, how, what were the key things you learned coming up? And then on top of that, would you share with us some of the 
if you had to do it again, what would you not do? What were the, you would say your, your worst mistakes, but that you turned around and it made you who you are today? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. You, uh, there, there are so many uh, yeah, mistakes you are going to make uh, along the way, but honestly, I would do it the same exact way because it comes down to, um, I, I think, uh, character and mm -hmm. and you know treating people well along the way you know like I, I always come down to the basics because um, there's one thing I know about Nigerians who are smart as hell I don't know if I can say that you know they're, they're Nigerians are just naturally smart people I don't care what anybody says you know like Africans are smart Nigerians are incredibly smart you know so I pride myself with that. I'm not saying, and I wasn't one of the smartest, you know, like, but I used my Nigerian, uh, uh, what Nigeria has given me, ra being raised there. Um, meaning, you respect people as you go along, you know, and you know your boundaries, you know your limits, you know the edge where to push, and you know um, where to hold back um, mm -hmm. as, as, as you go. Um, right. And um, for me, uh, intelligence is just continue, you continue learning, you continue learning. And some of the things that you don't do so well, you try to do them, uh, do them even better. Uh, and, and when you know better, um, I say that you always uh, do better. Another thing is um, you show more passion than ambition. Some of us become too ambitious, right? We, can't, we, we say we want to get somewhere and Sometimes you want to get there by all means, you know. Right. I never use that in, 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 in growing. Um, I use my passion, you know, the passion for uh, the game, the passion for people, the mm. passion for different cultures. I'm never one to criticize another culture or criticize another place because we find ourselves in those places, right? And sometimes you have to adapt. I think that's something that's wrong, a lot of times wrong with the world. Some of us just grew up in different places. I grew up in Zaria and I had the best upbringing and I wouldn't change it for anything. I had the best upbringing ever. And I use those values um, to encourage um, and, and uh, to teach even myself, you know, how and to educate myself on encounters that I'm going to have uh, mm -hmm. in life. And I'm very, I, I'm absolutely proud uh, mm -hmm. of that. I wouldn't change, it would, wouldn't change anything at all. Thank you so much. As we, we have a few more minutes, but I want to open it up to the panelists to ask your questions of Mr. Yuri, because, you know, it's just such a privilege for us to be in the same room virtually talking with him. So I would say, uh, Dr. Yetunde, what question would you have for uh, Mr. Yuri? Um, just being in, you know, in your leadership position, how do you, what do you feel your responsibility is to, in a sense, usher, usher Nigeria into the roadmap in every stage and every level of success that you have been through? Do you feel more of a responsibility? Do you feel that it's, it is, it is your, it's a, it's a purpose for you to bring Nigeria forward? Um, and what other plans do you have in, in possibly maybe setting up, you know, I know that you do a lot of the humanitarian projects in Nigeria when it comes to basketball. Are you looking to expand it in, and in what ways? Uh, yeah, so it, it's an obligation almost, you know, you, you, it's something that I think of every day. I can't, I can't, every day I go to sleep, you know, like I think of my family, I think of my work, I think of Nigeria, and then I think of youth. Yeah, we have to think of the youth. I, I, we, we, that's, that's something that's so important to me is how we bring the youth up and, and what we're teaching them as, as, we, as we go. And um, uh, we have to pass all of this to mm. them. Yeah, we, we, we just have to, you know. And sometimes I think we concentrate so much on ourselves I challenge everybody, I challenge leaders, I challenge people all over the world, Nigerians, especially people listening now is, how are we giving the youth opportunity? Yeah, because I saw how the kind of opportunity that I was given as, as, as a young man, you know, where it worked and where it didn't work, what inspired and the path that you could take. And, and I really feel that uh, it's a responsibility for 
uh, leaders in Nigeria. I love the work that BEMI is doing. All of you guys are doing incredible work, you know, like with encouraging young women. Yeah, we have to encourage young women. We have to. They're so smart. I went in my organization from hiring, from having one woman that works in a male dominant industry to having 15 now. Mm -hmm. And they can do so much, you know, like, and then I look at African women. We stand tall, mm -hmm. we bring command, they're smart, you know, like they do. We have to continue. We have to give opportunities to youth, uh, to women, to all religions, to all people. That's who we are. That's what our country is. And you go all over the world, there is a Nigeria. I'm telling you, there's nowhere you look, you're going to find a Nigeria. I agree. I Thank agree. you so much. So, uh, Mr. Musa and Fatima, any other question, please? For our uh, keynote speaker, who has graciously okay. given us his time. Okay. Uh, um, I I have one question is um what advice do you have for like us youths that are like planning to like come back home to Nigeria it's a it's such a it's such a great question um because I think a lot of people sometimes struggle with coming home and I think this is I, I say this with 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 as uh, being very very humble because I don't, I want people to take the president of Toronto Raptors out of it. I started coming home um, when I was an unpaid scout. So I was not even getting, when I was playing uh, for the national team and I got cut from the national team a couple of times. I actually got cut one time in the airport. The coach called me and told me you're not going, you know, like, so sometimes when we Africans are coming back from where we are, we sometimes think that we have to have a lot to come back because you, you almost want to, uh, you're almost proud that, okay, I'm coming from the US, I'm coming from wherever it is, you know, I have to have enough money. I have, yes, you have to have that, but I think Nigerians seeing you and you having an effect there and what you do, going back to Medugri or Borno or where you're from and people actually seeing you and you having that effect. People in diaspora, come home, come home, you know, come and experience what Nigeria is. People will say to me, I went to Meduguri um, two, three years ago. You know, people say, okay, oh, you're yeah, going to Meduguri. Why, why would I be scared of going to Meduguri when I grew up in Zaria? You know, like is somebody that's from New Jersey scared of going to New Jersey? You know, like that's how I see it. And I understand politics. I understand everything that's going on. I understand some of the issues we have. But when you are from there, this is who you are. This is where you grow up. We have to be proud of it. Yeah, we have to be proud. And I'm so happy that you are proud of where you're from. It shows. It shows from how you speak. It shows from you being at home now and you're stuck home. Yeah, things happen. We persevere. We're resilient. We get through it. And we help others and we keep going. And we're going to go through hard times. Trust me, there's nobody that's not. What do you miss most from Nigeria? What from Nigeria? Uh, I, I, want, I would have said the food, you know, I, I would have said the food. But, but I eat a lot. My wife, my wife is from Guinea and she cooks Nigerian food. I eat everything. I go see everything that you can think of. Suya. Uh, everything. I love the food. I, I just miss the people all the time. I miss my parents, you know, but my parents come here often. Nigeria is incredible. I love it. I love being in Lagos. I love being in the north. I love being in Abuja. Um, it's, it's something that, that I am really, really proud of. But, you know, going to those typical places where you can get to, going to the University of Suya, going to all those places. Uh, <laughs> I think that I love, you know, so that's what I missed. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. We've run out of our time here. We believe in making our nation proud, and you're just uh, such a light. And uh, I think I'm grateful to all the panelists, and especially, you know, the, the youths that have spoken so eloquently and from their heart passionately uh, this afternoon. And I thank you again for your time.